And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Kirsten Conrad, our uh, extension agent, and she will be giving our presentation today. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Colleen, and especially thank you to you and to Julie for facilitating today's session. Um, I also want to introduce to all of our attendees today, uh, Bernadette O'Neill and Kathy Iden, who are Extension Master Gardener interns with our program here in Arlington and Alexandria. We have about 230 members of our program here, volunteers in our program, and it's a very robust program. I'm very proud of what they do. Uh, today's presentation is going to be on summer pruning, but we also have a winter pruning class, which uh, we do during the dormant season, which is more suitable for some of the trees and shrubs that we're, um, we're talking about today, but I'll surely point that out. Thank you to all of you who have already put in suggestions and questions into the chat box. Please continue to do so, and we will address most of those as we go along. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end of the session to um, answer um, questions, you know, additional questions. So um, we do have a help desk. Uh, help desk email is mgarlex at gmail.com. And this is um, only operating by email at the moment because our office spaces at the Farrington Community Center in Arlington, Virginia are, no, are not open yet. Um, they're still closed to us for COVID precautions. Public education classes, all of you are here today, so you know somewhat about how to find our public education classes, but these are classes that are advertised through the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia uh, website, um, which is an astounding um, and very active um, organization of Extension Master Gardeners that support the work of Extension. So thank you for being here today. Today we're talking about pruning of trees, shrubs, and herbaceous perennials. Um, we are basically going to be talking about the deliberate act of wounding a plant to achieve a desired result. And this sounds um, a, little, a little harsh, but this is exactly what it is doing. You know, we are um, cutting away um, extraneous growth. We are helping to train the plant to make it stronger. We are deliberately choosing to prune it to be able to maybe achieve better flowering, maybe to achieve a better form. Whatever it is, we are um, doing some pruning on it. We are gonna start off by talking about how to avoid having to prune so very, very much. Um, it's a chore that many people find tedious. And of course, it's something that all of us have to do because if you have a, have a garden for more than three or five years, you've got plants that are crowded that need to be pruned. We talk about why the, the why pruning is necessary sometimes and um, what the essential tools are for doing a good job. Of course, the timing is, is all important and uh, we have divided our pruning education efforts into basically dormant season and summer pruning efforts. But today we are gonna be talking about much, a lot of shrub pruning. We're gonna be talking about perennial pruning. And we'll do a little bit of chat about the hedges and, and rejuvenation pruning that some people find necessary to do. We will briefly touch on cicada damage and what you can do about that. And of course, because we get asked so often, we'll talk about hydrology pruning at the very end. First of all, I want to say that there is an advertisement for right plant, right place. Um, many, this, and sadly, this is a very common situation with people seeing, uh, uh, you know, not being able to um, deal with um, plants that are overgrown in the landscape. Um, the plants have, have outgrown their usefulness in the site that they were planted, and perhaps they were chosen for the wrong place to begin with. Um, this is something that we see all the time as well. This plants are planted in, in next to a sidewalk or a curb, and they're growing out of the sidewalk and they require pruning. If we plan before we plant, we can choose a plant that will not outgrow the space which is allotted to it. And part of that is, is just doing your homework before we choose a plant. And part of it is just doing a little bit of shopping and, part, and just citing the plant appropriately in the landscape. For example, this little plant here, this is an Ilex vomitoria, but it's a cultivar of a fabulous native plant, which is very, very tough. Um, it's called Oscar, and it's a compact dwarf self-pruning, self-pruning, um, North American native, Holly. It is, um, this is particularly marketed by plantthelights.com, but this is a plant that gets about two feet wide, by about two feet tall. 
what's not to like? You know, it's it's a it's a basic um, green that does flower, but it's not showy. But how about something else? How about something like sugar chip rose of Sharon on the left side there, and spilled wine Nigeria in the middle. Rose of Sharon, for those of you who like it, um, I know that um, is a plant that reseeds itself prolifically. Well, this is one is sterile, no ma lower maintenance. Okay, it has gorgeous, you know, little uh, white edges on the leaves, and it's sterile, and it only gets five feet tall by about four feet wide. Spilled wine wagyria, two by three. These are examples of the cultivars that are coming out of the nursery industry for people who don't like to prune and who have very small gardens like most of us in, in, in urban areas do. Finally, I wanna mention this one, um, Starlet Pacifica, um, um, which is a, a, a three feet by three feet tall. And those of you who grow standard Pacifica know that it will get 10 feet tall by 10 feet wide if you let it quite easily. I love Pacifica. I think it's an early spring uh, harbinger and it's a great plant to have in the landscape but it's too big for um, small urban landscapes and it ends up looking like that, okay? And this plant is a uh, Pacifica. It's obviously very old. It's obviously very grown, overgrown. And I want you to hold on to this idea of right plant, right case as we go through this presentation because much of what we're talking about today um, is, is avoidable um, by proper plant selection and placement. The reason we prune, in addition to prop to size control, is to remove dead, damaged, or diseased wood. Um, anything that is dying um, needs to be replaced so that the plant can begin the process of rejuvenation and replacement of that dead wood with healthy living tissue. We prune also to promote um, healthy, uh, not only regrowth, but also um, terminal growth to, to make sure that it is, it is growing in the direction and the form that we want it to grow. And of course, sometimes, many times, we prune to improve air circulation. Uh, air circulation is key to preventing um, many of the fungal diseases that, that result from overcrowding and, and, and dense growth, and improving air circulation and um, light uh, into the plant through pruning can result in a healthier plant as well. Finally, um, there are many times when we, um, as, as gardeners, want to create a special effect. What well, maybe it's a hedge, maybe it's an espalier with a plant trained to a, a, a fence-like structure, or a wireframe, or a trellis. Um, pollarding is another type of special effects where trees are pruned to create a, a bush on a stalk type effect. Okay. Um, there, there are reasons for pruning that are purely ornamental and decorative. So one of the things that we need to remember is what it is, why it is, what the goals are when we're pruning, okay? We want to remove dead, damage, and disease branches and plant growth. We want to remove overlapping and crossing branches. And this is a, this is a, a trial sometimes because, you know, there are some shrubs if you removed every single crossing branch, you wouldn't have very much left. What comes to mind are things like Pacifica, um, white, you know, Viburnum, and those kinds of branches have very dense, shrubs have very dense branch structures. But the, remember the overall goal is to open up the inside of the plant and increase air circulation and um, to air and light. And also the predator insects, you know, the, um, the beneficial insects can access the center of the plant to deal with, with um, um, pest insects in a better way if we open up and allow air and light to, to circulate in there. Finally, um, pruning to a natural form is always to be desired. Uh, we see many plants in an urban landscape that have been pruned into uh, what we jokingly call meatloaf forms, um, but the, the natural form is always going to be a healthier form than the um, plant form, the meatloaf, the squared off, pruned off, plant shape that we force a plant to grow into. Um, we prune to control vegetative growth versus flower seed production. Um, sometimes we want more flowers and seeds and sometimes we don't. Um, classic examples are that um, most plants, most woody plants that we, we grow for 
producing flowers or fruit from, do so when they are, are allowed to produce flowers and fruit production on a younger set of branches. As plants get older, they become less able, less willing, um, less prone to producing abundant flowers and fruit. So vegetate, controlling the vegetative growth so that we have always have new growth coming up from the base is a great way to uh, maintain optimal flower and fruit production. Also, sometimes you don't want those flowers and seeds. I know many people who remove the flowers and seed pods of plants that they don't want to reseed in their garden. Um, just this morning, we were talking about Rose of Sharon. And Rose of Sharon, uh, some, some are beautiful flowering plants, but you don't want them to reseed in your garden because you will have too many of them. So some people re try to remove those seed heads. So the natural form of this azalea is something to be desired. You know, we would much prefer to see it in this shape than we had to see it in this shape. The, um, the health benefits are, are well documented. Um, and the, um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the uh, um, uh, ornamental benefits are, are also much higher with the natural form than they are with the uh, pruned azalea. So what have you got to work with? Um, this is our basic toolbox right here. Um, hand clippers are for summer pruning, an essential tool that we must have. You may have a bypass pruner, you may have an anvil type pruner, which, which has a blade that comes down flat on top of an opposite blade, opposite side. Um, bottom line is if you keep them sharp, they will perform well for you, okay? Um, safety gloves and goggles are a must. Um, you know, whether you're working with thorny plants or just um, plants that have many sharp ends um, sticking out, safety goggles or some form of glasses that can protect your eyes from air and branches is uh, essential. Um, sharpening tools for keeping your tools sharp um, should be in everybody's toolbox. Um, a sharp tool that can make a clean cut on a plant is going to result in a faster um, sealing or regrowth or healing process. I don't want to use the word healing because we don't, plants don't heal quite the same way that people do, um, but they do um, if, respond well to a sharp, clean cut um, that is made from a, from, a, from a clean tool, much better than they do from a tool that, that leaves a ragged cut. So make sure your tools are sharp. Loppers, um, any kind of clippers that can deal up to with branches up to an inch or an inch and three quarters in diameter would be an essential part of your pruning toolbox, as is a pruning saw. Now the pruning saws that I like is not, are not pictured here, but they are collapsible um, tools, pruning saws that can get with a very narrow blade that can get into very small spaces and do lock in order to stay safe. Finally, pole pruners, you're probably not going to use a pole pruner for summer pruning very often, but it is an essential tool for removing broken, dead or diseased um, branches from trees or, or shrub branches that you can't reach very well. Okay, so the timing of pruning cuts is a very essential um, question that occupies a great deal of energy um, for most people who are concerned about this. It is an important question, but as a rule, we don't want to, I'm gonna try to explain this diagram to you. We try to avoid pruning plants that are deciduous between September and December in our climate. And this is because the regrowth that a plant generates in response to pruning does not have enough time when pruned in the fall to harden off. And if we get a severe cold in January or February, after that regrowth, that new regrowth has occurred, that new growth will be damaged. So starting in about September here, and moving all the way up to the end of December, at least in Northern Virginia, we try to avoid pruning deciduous plants. Starting in January and February, however, 
we do try to um, wait to prune, do dormant pruning on woody plants. And that's because we know that the plants are dormant, they're unlikely to start growing if we prune them at the end of January and February. And if we prune them right as growth is starting at the beginning of March, those pruning cuts are more likely to be hidden by quick regrowth, okay? So the dormant season is when we focus on doing ornamental shrubs, fruit trees, and of course, plants that are summer bloomers. Let's talk about that just for a second here. We call this the June 1st rule. If a plant blooms, an ornamental plant blooms before June 1st, it is blooming on with flowers that were set the previous year. A perfect example I can give you are things like, I'm just gonna mention crepe myrtle or azaleas, I'm sorry, azaleas. Okay, azaleas bloom before June 1st and are setting their flowers right about now for next year's bloom time. So if I prune in this area, any time from September to the time it blooms in March and April, I am removing the flowers that were already set last year. If it blooms before June 1st, again, that means that the flowers were set last year or prior to the start of the growing season. Summer bloomers, however, are plants that bloom after June 1st. And the perfect example I can give you that everybody knows are crepe myrtles. If you prune a crepe myrtle in the springtime before new growth starts or in the winter when it's dormant, it will still bloom this year in the summertime because it's blooming on new wood, okay? The new wood, produces flower buds at the ends of the new wood. And that means that you can prune at any time before that new growth starts to be produced. So we, again, we call that the June 1st rule. And I'm sure all of you can think of examples and we will talk about more of it when we do questions and answers. But all you have to remember is if it blooms before June 1st, it's setting flowers on last year's wood and you want to prune it after it flowers. If it blooms after June 1st, it's blooming on this current year's growth. And while you can still bloom it, prune it after it flowers, you can also prune it before it starts growing in the springtime. If you're not sure when to prune, make sure that you prune two to three work weeks after your plant blooms. Evergreens, as a rule, get pruned in dormant season from November to February and just before growth starts. Um, but there always are questions and exceptions to that. Camellias, for example, we have Camellia sasanqua and Camellia japonica. Camellia sasanqua is what we would call a fall bloomer, um, late fall, and Camellia japonica blooms in winter time or late winter, early, early, early spring. If you prune it in Camellia japonica in December, you might not have any flowers for February. It depends completely on the, on the bloom time. So the best rule is plant after it blooms. Two to three weeks after it blooms, that's when you prune them. Christmas trees and evergreens that are pruned to a particular form. This is the time to prune it because the cuts will be, uh, the tree is dormant, it's not likely to regrow right away, that new growth is not likely to be cut, damaged by, by cold. But typically those kinds of plants are, are, are sheared in order to produce um, thick growth. And that happens best when it is an actively growing season. Cherry oils. Cherry laws bloom in early spring. And if you prune them in the spring, you, you may lose some flowers. But again, that's not mostly why we grow laws. So you can prune it when it's dormant. You can prune it again in the summer, and I promise you, you will, because they do grow fast. Um, hollies, if we prune it in the wintertime, we're losing the fruit. When do you prune it? 
prune it when it gets too big, okay? You're never going to remove all of your Holly's new berries, but you wanna make sure that you um, are controlling, uh, controlling the growth in a healthy way. But if you have any questions about timing of cuts or how you keep your tools sharp, or any other thing you'd like to know up to this point. Oh my goodness, there are lots of questions. There were at least three questions on, is it too late to prune azaleas now if you want to do a little bit of cleanup pruning? Okay, is it too late to prune azaleas? We could have done it best about, a, about three weeks ago. Um, if you're just doing a little bit of thinning or you know taking isolated branches away, yes, no, you can do it fine right now, okay? Um, my grandfather had a saying, uh, when there was the right time to prune, and he said that the time was when your tools were sharp and your spirit was willing. <laughs> Seriously, right. you can, you, you can, um, you can prune your azaleas now, but do not do an overall um, shearing or size reduction because if you do, you will not have flowers next spring. Okay. Um, there was a question in the chat early on about pruning suckers. Do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, um, the suckers of talking on a woody plant and typically on a tree, uh, uh, adventitious growth that is coming from the root of the plant. And typically it comes out from the base of the plant. And there are certain woody plants that are prone to produce um, lots of suckers, crab apples, um, service berries, um, viburnum sometimes. And those suckers, however, general, in, a, in a tree form, you want to be removing those suckers, generally speaking. Um, in a shrub, especially a multi-stem shrub, those suckers are what form the basis for the replacement growth when you take out the oldest wood. So you want to make sure that you are choosing, sometimes choose, leaving some of those to be able to um, rejuvenate the growth of the entire plant. Okay. So you mentioned the uh, service berries. Um, how, how do you prune service berries and hawthorns? Okay, service berries and hawthorns are usually pruned as tree form. Mm -hmm. And this presentation, simply because there's so much material, it's not going to talk very much about trees and tree shaping and pruning. But generally you want to do size reduction and thinning to keep the um, plant from becoming too thick. But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Okie doke. Uh, I know you're going to talk about hedges. Um, there was a question about pruning a rose of Sharon that's too tall. Um, rose, let's, hold, let's hold some of the how to prune specific okay. plants questions. And I think some of those will be answered as we go along. Okay. Someone asked a question about how do you tell if something is dead versus dormant? Ah, well, that's a great question. Um, when you are looking at your plant in March and you are trying to decide whether it's dead or diseased or, or, or just dormant, you can simply nip the surface of the wood and determine whether it is green beneath that nook, beneath that cut. Underneath the bark is the cambium layer, which in living tissue should be green when you cut into it. If it is not green, then it may be dead and you can continue to um, check the stem closer to the base as you get closer to the base and determine where the tissue is live and healthy. Once you define that spot, you want to cut to the nearest side branch, which is healthy. Side branch or side bud, which is healthy and green underneath the level of the bark. Great. Uh, Kirsten, do you know a reference um, that lists plants that bloom on old wood versus new wood? Um, yes, we have. Virginia Tech has um, publications, um, shrub pruning calendars, and um, they we have not provided specific links to those at this point because the Virginia Tech um, publications um, resource uh, has recently changed their locations and is busy um, um, revamping some of the old publications. I do believe the um, present the 
shrub pruning calendars, which list specific plants and when to prune them, is still available um, at resources.vt.edu. Okay, great. Um, a lot of the rest of the questions are about individual plants, so I think we should hold those until a little bit later. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. So this next section is going to talk about the different types of cuts that are used to, to do this work. Thinning cuts um, are cuts that promote growth throughout the plant. Okay, and that thinning cuts are typically used to remove older overgrown um, branches from the center of the plant. They are used to increase air circulation. They are used to um, um, open up um, essentially holes in the plant um, that will allow new growth to be generated and come out from the center. Cutting back cuts are cuts that direct growth to certain areas or certain directions that we wish them to grow. Cutting back cuts can also be used to thicken a plant surface up, to thicken the growth up and increase new, new growth. Um, I hesitate to, to, to say that because in the example I gave earlier with the, um, with the evergreen trees that are used for holidays, um, the thickening of growth at the surface of the plant is generally desirable, but in the landscape, it is generally not desirable, okay? And so the preferred technique of cutting back cuts is not to thicken the surface of growth, uh, which is so often done with um, uh, incorrect pruning of landscape plants, but to um, open up and direct growth to a side branch which is growing in the direction that we want it to grow. Okay, heading back cuts are the number one cut that we use for size reduction. And so when we're trying to reduce the size of a plant, we want to use heading back cuts to reach way down inside the plant and remove um, um, a branch that is too, that, that is going, that is too long, too big. Okay, so I mentioned the um, poor pruning practices of commercial um, landscapers, and that is, they come in with the shears and they will prune an evergreen shrub like a yew or a holly um, to the point where you have um, repeated um, instances of new growth happening at the same space, the same plane. And after a, a few years of this, even a few seasons sometimes, you end up with a shell of green on the outside of the plant and nothing growing on the inside. And if you are unfortunate enough to have that situation already, you need to be taking your little hand pruners as a depicted in the photo there and go through this plant and thin the plant and open holes in that green canopy to be able to allow new growth to be generated from the center. You need to do those thinning cuts, okay? Um, shearing again, the, however, is the first thing that we do on hedges to shape them but we can also do it naturally. Finally, rejuvenation as a last resort is something that we can use to um, really um, drastically cut back a plant that will, um, this too big. Okay, thinning cuts. Um, again, um, these are examples that we can give you here for single stem shrubs um, like laurel, boxwood, azalea, and that sort of thing. Thinning cuts are used to um, open up the center to air and light and rejuvenate the plant from the center outwards. It's used to remove old growth that is um, um, not flowering or fruiting as well and allow it to, um, to open up the center. For multi-stem plants like forsythia, quince, or perhaps red twig dogwood, thinning cuts are used to remove and rejuvenate the plant by removing the oldest um, stems from the base. Essentially about, you can, on an annual basis, you can cut a third of the oldest, plant, oldest stems out um, to encourage rejuvenation and new growth. This, this is something that's entirely um, um, subjective and you have to judge how much wood you have on your plant to start with. You want to thin the oldest stems first to encourage younger growth. And after that, you need to do it on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether or not there is 
um, sufficiently new growth going on. This is a really great technique to use for rejuvenating an old basithia or an old red twig dogwood. And many times it's quite easy to see uh, by looking at the plant, especially in the dormant season, what the, uh, what the oldest growth is. In the red twig dogwood, for example, the newest growth is gonna be that bright red stem. The old growth is gonna be kind of a gray, gnarly looking um, um, bark on the outside of the plant. And so if you, can, if you want that red color, you're going to have to cut those older stems out of the base and allow it to, those suckers to come out again. Cutting cuts are the primary tool that are used to, to reduce the size and direct the growth, um, as I mentioned earlier. You want to cut to an outward facing bud and stagger the height of the cuts. You want to bury the cuts inside the body of the plant and not just cut at the surface of the plant. As the drawing indicates there, the plant that's on the left shows different cuts that are made at different heights within the plant in order to um, sustain regrowth that is um, going to distribute new um, healthy tissue throughout the plant, not just at the surface of it. And finally, as with the um, thinning cuts, you want to limit your reduction whenever possible to no more than one third of the total volume of the plant. Why is that magic? It's because the plant still needs leaves to produce energy to sustain itself. And a drastic cut of a half to more of the, of the plant material will be a setback for the health of the plant. Finally, don't leave stubs when you cut it. And the drawing at the bottom here shows some, some variations on individual cuts. The one on the left side, you see the cut, the small angled cut immediately adjacent to a side bud. Uh, the, one, the second one in from the left shows a much larger angled cut that is made at a, a much um, um, broader angle. Um, the, Third one in the middle shows a bud and then a, a section of stem or stub, which is left behind. And of course, the fourth one shows a raggedy, jagged, broken off um, surface. And the fourth one, the last one, the fifth one shows um, a cut, which was made very, very close at the bud itself. The correct cut you want to aim for is the first one on the left um, in the in the second one, um, the, the angle of the cut is too great and it leaves more surface area for disease and decay to enter that cut surface. It also leaves a part of a stub there. And as in the third example, that stub is going to die back and it's going to die back to that, to that bud. And that does not allow the woody plant to seal that wound and to produce new growth readily to um, replace what has been cut. The fourth cut, of course, um, is not a cut at all. It's just a broken off end. And when, whenever you have that situation with broken wood, storm damaged wood, you need to try to go in there and recut and make a clean cut there so that um, the plant can begin to seal off that, that wound. And finally, the last one is too close because you have done, you've done damage to the growing bed that is going to be left behind. And you need to have some space there for that bed to be, um, to, to grow without having to worry about sealing over that wound. So again, the first cut on the left is the correct one. I should have done a little graphic there to show that, but the one on the left is the best way to do this. And it's angled cut. Uh, there is some discussion at the moment about leaving cuts at a, at right angles because that would be the right angle to the stem because that of course would be the least, um, the least exposure to the cut end. But this angled cut does allow water to run off easily and not sit on the end of the stem. Every pruning job combines both limit thinning cuts and, um, and heading back cuts. And on mounding shrubs, this is going to be essential to uh, everything you do. 
Just a couple of real life examples here. This is a Forsythia show. Remember that overgrown Forsythia we showed about five slides back? This was uh, a picture in May, April or May of a Forsythia shrub that was about 12 to 15, 12 feet tall, 12 to 15 feet tall. Can't really get a scale uh, uh, by looking at this picture. Um, but this is uh, April, May Forsythia shrub. May 13th, two weeks after the end of flowering, um, the plant was, all this old growth was removed. Everything three quarters of an inch or larger in diameter was removed. And um, it was uh, pretty a lot, it was way more than one third of the plant, right? So here we have it after pruning. Doesn't look so hot, does it? But here's what it looks like a month later. You've got all that new growth coming out, those, those um, at this point, um, aesthetically speaking, I would go in there and remove those um, long spindly stems that are, are left behind um, and, um, uh, and go from there. But plants do recover from pruning. They recover from our mistakes pretty well too. 